I'm a, I am a professional speaker designer, uh, as well as being a professional naval historian. Uh, but um, uh, I was, I was, am, and always will be at how to DIY. Uh, I design speakers because I enjoy it, uh, and I don't make any pretense of saying, so, you know, so you fifty pencils suddenly give you a better sound than thirty thousand quid's worth of B and W. Well, actually, it might, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> in 99.999999% uh, in of the circumstances, no, of course it won't. But uh, <laughs> it is an interesting hobby, to put it mildly, uh, and you can, a very rewarding one, and you can get extremely good results. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't, because if they do, they've got an agenda and it's not one that's working in your favour. Yeah, a self-portrait of uh, me uh, in front of uh, the ocean of design, uh, thinking, what the hell am I doing? And uh, I like to think that I know a little bit about it. Uh, I mentioned this to you earlier. A favourite quote of mine from Tom Danley, uh, the ancients keep stealing all of my best ideas. Uh, the reality is, there is, uh, this is a fact, there are no new types of loudspeaker enclosure. Period. End of story. Anybody so says otherwise is lying. There aren't any. Western Electric, Cumbell Labs, RCA, Stromberg, Carlson, Jensen and others, mostly the Americans it has to be said, beat us all to it in the 1920s, 30s and 40s. About the closest you got to a new cabinet after that was something like the Bandpass, which really started out with something like the Kelson enclosures, which uh, are an acquired taste, shall we say. Not one I personally like, but some people love them, and uh, why not? These, uh, these companies just had huge, they were huge corporations. They had vast engineering resources, and they just hurled everything they had at it. And they measured everything, they built everything, they tested everything to death. The only things really they didn't do, digital and signal processing, and that's about it. The technology of the time wasn't there. Otherwise, <sighs> engineering enclosures uh, and systems is largely a matter of using sort of more modern developments of what we've got, like some of uh, Mark's new driver technology. Uh, the latest, really the new development, or the latest sort of genuine new developments have been digital carrier mediums and manipulating things in the digital domain. That's about it, truth be told. Feel small parameters, which are what most of us tend to use when designing an enclosure, uh, as basically a method of applying electrical filter theory to these things, electromechanical transducers. The only purpose behind one of those is to convert electrical signals into mechanical energy. The mechanical energy obviously being the movement of the air. That's it, there's no other purpose behind them. Otherwise we might as well just weld them into our heads. That's about it. Loudspeaker enclosure types, uh, if you can call some of them enclosures, there are a number of them. There are open baffles, which are exactly what they sound like, just flat baffles. Uh, there are U-frames, open back boxes basically, a box without a back on. Sometimes they don't have a top on either. You have H-frames, which if you look down, basically it's a box open at the front and the back with a panel in the middle with the driver through it. That's an H-frame. So it's reasonably symmetrical front and back. Sealed boxes, two different types. There are sealed boxes, the original type, and there are acoustic suspension boxes, which if you look at the patterns of the acoustic suspension, uh, it was basically using the internal air as the suspension of the driver, which in itself is not a bad idea, the, the principle being that it, you know, it's quite linear. The problem is that air heats up. So it isn't always quite as linear as you think it is. The acoustic suspension has largely died out now because the type of drivers that tended to be designed for it, quite heavy cones, not always very efficient, very low resonant frequencies have pretty much died out. They've died, they've died a bit of a death, largely because of the problems with efficiency. Vented boxes. 
what they sound like, boxes with vents in. Uh, there is the original bass reflex, designed, uh, developed by Albert Thuras in the 1930s. Uh, there is then the modern interpretation of it, which is the vented or ducted box. And then, slightly more controversially, there is the chambered backloaded horn, which is just the most extreme variation on the vented box. Vented box, you've got a very small horn, it's the port, and a, quite a large volume. A backloaded horn, you've got a small volume and a very large port that just happens to be expanding. It's the baseline physics it has a fundamental similarity. And you still use some, not all, but some of the same engineering principles. And then you have quarter wave boxes. They can be straight, untapered, they might be narrowing towards the terminus, they might be expanding in which case it's a horn, it might not be impedance matched, but it's still a horn, as far as I'm concerned at any rate. And then there is the transmission line, which is a horrible, horrible term that uh, has become such a catch-all that some people use it to refer to a box that is the polar opposite of what some other people use the term to describe as. So uh, some people may, in other words, some people use transmission line to describe a box that's very, very highly resonant which isn't quite what was intended, but be that as it may, it's become such a catch-all that people do describe it like that. And others dis use it to describe a box that's com almost completely unresonant. How mad is this? It's just crazy. But, you know, it's, it's a catch-all term. We're never going to change the terminology now, so we, ju we go into it w with an awareness of that. Uh, transmission line is a term that you have to be very careful about. Three of my engineering heroes, John Scott Russell, the man who designed and built Isambard Kingdom Brunel's Great Eastern. Brunel didn't design the Great Eastern, that man did. He, was also, he also came up with something called the Ice Acoustic Curve, which deliberately or otherwise, most of the great concert halls in the world actually follow some kind of plan of in the seating alignment. Sir so William Henry White, the greatest warship designer of all time and a big music lover as well because he appreciated balance. He wouldn't focus on one aspect of design. He tried to consider a broad series of matters. And the late, great Carl Sagan, astrophysicist, exobiologist, music lover, the man responsible for the gold re disc record on the Voyager space probes, and another man who understood that it's important to take quite a wide I don't like the term holistic, but it's a good phrase in this circumstances, view. And it applies to speaker design. Design really starts, for me, it's a process. It begins with a series of questions about objectives. What is the goal behind designing your speaker? Yeah, uh, good sound. Yeah, well that's not an answer. Well, that, what does good sound mean? Good sound doesn't mean a single thing. It means different things to different people. And what might be appropriate in one set of circumstances is completely inappropriate in another. I could build a 10 foot tall line array. Oh, wonderful, I've got an eight foot high ceiling. So it might be wonderful in a very tall room, but it's useless if I've got a room that it doesn't fit in. Yeah, it's a, a silly example, but it also is one that illustrates that fundamental truth. You know, you need to ask, uh, what are your objectives? So, what are you trying to achieve? What are the broad objects in terms of your sound, your sonic characteristics? Are these actually going to be practical for your budget, for what you're intending to do? You know, you, you need to factor these in. Enclosure size, how big is it going to be? Will it actually fit in the space? Is it going to be too small for the space, for that matter? Enclosure position. Where is it going to be? These things. The most notorious part of the entire hi-fi chain. The room. Often ignored, and they shouldn't be, because they can make or break a loudspeaker. Particularly the positioning as well. Yeah, not all of us can throw huge amounts of foam and damping material at, in rooms. I can't. You know? But you can hopefully design a speaker for a given situation that will try and account for the room acoustics. System used in. What is your amplifier? Yeah? Not, all not all amplifiers are 
created equal. Uh, if you've got something like set amp, it will probably have a very high output impedance. And you sh really should factor that into your because if you don't, it will mess up the alignment. Simple as that. A lot of set amps, by the way, to, uh, particularly vintage American ones, tend to measure, have an output impedance of about 2.5 to 4 ohms, which is like artificially raising the Q of your drive unit significantly, which we'll come to in a second. That will completely foul up a base alignment, unless you factor that into it. So, you know, these are all points. Aesthetics. Not all of us can ignore aesthetics. Most of us can't no, ignore aesthetics, otherwise we'll get it in both ears. So, <laughs> yeah, it is a practical limitation. There are lots of supposedly phenomenal speakers out there that I don't know about you, but I couldn't live with because they look like a pair of Daleks. I don't want to be looking at that. Uh, there are certain speakers, which uh, I will not name, uh, that look like coffins. I don't know about anybody else, but I don't want to be staring at something that looks like a coffin either. You know, these, these, <laughs> you know it's, a, it's all practical things that you actually should consider from the off. Fail small parameters. Um, I'll, I'll sort of skip through this. Uh, they were largely created by small. Uh, who was effectively field student, uh, and their work was predated by a chap called Novak at Jensen Loudspeakers about 15 years earlier. They are very, very useful, but don't let anybody tell you that they are the be-all and end-all or some fixed line in the sand. They're not. They vary depending on your measurement conditions. What temperature is it? What's the humidity like? What's the air pressure? What voltage drive have you used for these? They actually change and can change quite significantly depending on these environmental factors. What's the output impedance of the amplifier? High output impedance or current drive, the Q goes through the roof. So again, these are factors that um, need to be considered. They're not a fixed point. They are a tool, a very useful tool. But like all tools, you use them. You don't let them control you. They're a snapshot of a driver under a given set of conditions. That's all. And the driver's innate response does not follow always this perfect mathematical curve. It's an approximation. All right? It's a very useful guideline, but it's no more than that, and you need to take wider things into consideration as well as that. So, what I thought I'd do is use this as a quick example. This was uh, a design I had to come up with about two weeks ago. Uh, a chap over in America, he says I do a lot of uh, work for um, American DIYers, wanted a small floor standing speaker. And he had a fairly particular set of requirements for this speaker. He wanted extension to the low 40s. 42 hertz roughly is open E string on a double bass. So other than concert grand piano, pipe organ and that sort of thing, it covers pretty much the gamut of acoustic music. Average listening level at about two meters distant would be roughly 75 decibels. He wanted to have 15 decibel dynamic peaks if he could to handle some spikes. Yeah. That's okay. Those were the sort of maximum points anticipated. He'd be listening to a variety of musical types, but mostly, mostly small piece uh, acoustic music, different types of acoustic blues, quartets, quintets, uh, very small piece jazz. I'm not a jazz fan personally. I like some of it, but uh, I'm sort of skipping that, shall we say. You get the idea. No doubt some of you lads know much more about it than I do. System features, uh, low output impedance amp, he's basically he's got a big fat solid state amp, I can't remember exactly what it was, I think it was a Mark Levinson or something like that. Uh, so it had a, a pretty solid damping factor, no real issues there, uh, and he was using conventional parallel pair speaker cable of fairly low resistance. Now, when you've got something like that, and you've got a set of binding posts, Low resistance speaker cable, pair of binding posts, you can probably add about half an ohm of series air into the circuit. No more than that. That's about what you can use. It's a, it's a rough guide. Uh, it shouldn't be any more than that, but it's worth sort of factoring in if you can. He didn't want any response shaping circuits and he wanted to be using Mark's drivers. Fine, okay. 
the, enclo the enclosure was going to be about 40 centimetres from the front wall, or a little bit further, uh, if and when his wife allowed him to do so. Based on that, I already knew from working with Mark's drivers that uh, eventually some kind, uh, it'd have an acoustically damped alignment so it doesn't start booming away in these rooms. I'll show you this in a minute. And that a reasonably wide baffle would allow this in a fairly compact box. So, I'm, again, I'm going to quickly skim over. That's the TS parameters of the Merc Audio Alpair 10P, an example of which you can see over there, I think. Have you got one of those there, Stefan? Yeah. Quite a popular driver, actually. In fact, I think that's one of your big sell biggest sellers, isn't it? Here it is, five inch paper curl. Quite a low resonant frequency. Lots and lots of linear travel, as you can see. It has an arrestor on it as well, so you can't go and drive it into over excursion and damage it. Extension out well past 20 kilohertz. This is a driver that can get to 40 hertz easily in the right box providing you don't expect miracles in terms of huge output. And if you're expecting it to equa equate to a couple of 15 inch woofers, then obviously you've got the wrong driver. But if you want that sort of music that I was talking about in a small cabinet, good choice. So, based on this data and factoring in a little bit of Series R for the cabling and uh, binding posts and whatnot, I knew 21 litres tuned to a a little bit below 40 hertz would give me the kind of alignment that would probably give him the extension he wanted. Now the question to that was because he doesn't want any extra response shaping circuits in it and the positioning in the room, how do I then set the proportions of the box? He wanted it to be fairly short as well which would then mean it has to be tilted back a little bit. Well, that's fine. You just put a slightly longer spike on the front than the, the back, and that'll give you the requisite tilt back. And if you make it adjustable, you can fine tune it. No issues on that front. So that's all, that's all sort of fairly straightforward. Question is, what sort of dimensions do we need then? Here's the basic box alignment. This is just off a simple Excel sheet called Unibox. Anybody can download it off the internet. There's a lot more in these things than actually meets the eye, to be honest. The, this is assuming purely anechoic conditions and it's purely mathematical, but it gives you a rough idea of what to expect. Dark blue line is your base alignment. See how it's rolling off at a fairly shallow rate. That's the sort of thing that works quite well in practice. It's if you've got a really, really flat base alignment, as soon as you put that box, that speaker, into a room, the bass just goes through the roof. You get, you get a big, big spike usually around tuning because of the room gain. So you're usually better off in practice having this slightly more damped alignment. The pale blue line shows the port output. Now that's another uh, good tip to look for. Sometimes you get very narrow box tunings for vented boxes. They look like a triangle, a sort of narrow triangle. And that, won't go too far into the detail, we can talk about that later if you want, which is where the driver response is no longer directed towards you because the wavelengths are too long to be supported by the front baffle and they start to wrap around the speaker in effect. The speaker starts to radiate into the sort of spherical omnidirectional fashion rather than directing it right at you. So, the question is, the wider the baffle, the lower that frequency occurs. So if you choose your baffle size carefully, you can start to blend these losses into each other and the output to get the most balanced possible response. That's the raw driver response on an IEC compliant test baffle. Huge baffles, yeah, so it's set many feet wide and tall. Yeah, that's just a pure anechoic response in the anechoic chamber. Here's a couple of speakers. I quite like that the proportions was kind of guided by this. This is a speaker, not one I designed. Lewis of OmegaLoudspeakers.com. Nice job, mate. It's been around for years. This is called the Super 3 XRS. Uh, it's a speaker I've always quite liked. I think it, it's, the proportions are quite nice. And I, 
But hang on a minute, the baffle size is about right here. Uh, I can borrow some of what Lewis achieved with this. It's not exactly the same size, but it's sort of in that neighborhood. Wide and shallow, you know, it's about so high. Yeah, it's, it's in the right neighborhood. So that, that kind of gave me a little bit of inspiration. So I did some simulations of the driver on a baffle of that size, or roughly that size, 11 inches wide, in this case, 28 inches tall. And that blue line is the result. And you can see we're starting to get the losses that we expect from about 250 hertz or so. But that's okay, because A, gain from the room is gonna be kicking in here, and B, we've got the box output as well. So that is actually going to start balancing things out quite nicely. So there we have, that's the red response is just the raw response of the driver. The blue is the driver on the baffle again, minus the box output. That's looking quite promising. Not bad, and it could have been made a bit wider, but we've got to balance off the size requirements, the practicalities, the aesthetics and everything. And it's, you know, it's, it's in the right region. It's sufficiently close to justify actually working up a design based on that driver with the box tuning had already worked out in a box of roughly those dimensions. I did another quick check of what that box and that driver would look like in roughly the desired distance from the front wall and about one and a half to two meters from the side walls. And that red response is what I got. It's not going to be exact, but that's roughly what I could expect. Output down to, and um, fairly balanced output, down to the high 30 hertz regions before it starts to roll away. So on the right track with that. Useful little bits of software, and all of these are sort of free to download. Uh, you, can get, you can get them online, it's not a problem. And this is the box I quickly came up with. Based on that, it's the 11 inch desired width, so it's giving you that correct baffle width. The height, 28 inches, was basically the maximum I was allowed to use. And the depth just gives the requisite volume. The driver is mounted fairly high up. Now, acoustically speaking, I'd prefer it in some ways to be a little bit lower down than that, but it's already quite a short box that needs tilting back. So if I mounted it any lower, it'd need even more of a tilt back and it'd look ridiculous. So that was a decent enough compromise, about five inches down. I've doubled the front baffle just to add a bit more structural strength because when you start cutting holes in baffles, it's quite a big hole. I mean, it's not the world's biggest driver, is it? But you still weaken the baffle when you cut a hole in it. So anything you can do to help um, for the sake of an extra layer, I thought, yeah, it's worth it. The box is lined on all faces, apart from right next to the driver, with just normal damping material. Personally, I don't like foam. I've never really had spectacular results with foam. Oh, well, I don't want spectacular results anyway. Um, it, for some people, it works, it works great. Uh, for me, I've, I don't particularly like it. I prefer acoustic fiberglass or SAE-rated wool felt. Uh, either work, they work more or less the same if you get the right uh, quantities. Uh, that's what I prefer. So all, layer, all box surfaces are lined with that, apart from right around the driver. And because it's taller than it is sort of wide and deep uh, significantly, I put four layers of that in the bottom just to absorb any standing wave that might happen to be present. Because this is a pure reflex design. It's not intended to be a quarter wave or anything like that. Vent size, uh, I can't remember. What, what did I use for the vent size? I used 40 millimeter diameter because um, that's what you happen to have uh, available quite cheaply. So yeah, it's a, it's a reasonable size. It's not, it's not too large. Because the wider you make, the wider the diameter the vent becomes, the longer you have to make that vent. And very long vents are half-wave resonators. They're just open pipes. They're open at both ends. They have their own harmonic structure. You don't want that. So 
it's a case of balancing off the diameter against the length. 40 millimeters is fine, it keeps the air velocity reasonably low and it keeps the vent reasonably short. So that, that was how I decided to settle on that. Box tuning I settled on finally was 38 hertz, which gives that progressively <coughs> damped rolling off base alignment. The minus three decibel frequency, I don't like really using it, we call it F3, is 52 hertz. Uh, personally, I find F3 a bit useless. F6, the minus six decibel frequency, 37 hertz. That's in an anechoic chamber though, remember. It's purely mathematical. As soon as you put it into a practical room, that bass response that is deliberately damped out suddenly flattens. It comes up. You're blending the box output with the gain that you get from the space. And that's how you design a speaker to avoid getting that sort of bass heavy, booming, thumping, not interacting well with the acoustic space. And there's another self-portrait of me there as a dinosaur, uh, <laughs> which I seem to be these days. It's not a complicated box at all. It's a perfectly simple cabinet. Uh, a straightforward vent, ducted vent, sometimes called a bass reflex box, that is relatively wide quite shallow, because that's the depth needed to get the right volume, and of the requisite sort of 28 inches height, which was the maximum I was allowed to have. Jobs are good. That's the alignment that uh, I came up with. Not a self-portrait, I'm not that smug. <laughs> it does look smug, doesn't it? <laughs> that, is one, that is one smug kangaroo. Uh, a few general thoughts on the subject. Uh, designing an enclosure for a given drive unit, so let's, uh, let's say that we've established that we want to have a given drive unit, should account for a reasonable number of variables. Don't just look at your plot that you've got from WinISD or whatever, that it's spat out, or no, not to not WinISD, it's quite a useful program. Uh, try and account for a bunch of other things as well. It's not difficult to do so, just think about where it's going to go for a start, where's the box going to go? and manipulate your alignment accordingly. Amplifier, you know, what's its sort of output impedance? If you don't know, if it's a straightforward solid state, it's not going to be too much of a problem. Just potentially add a little bit of series resistance if you can, or account for a little bit of that just for the cable and the connectors. The space we already mentioned, the aesthetics as well. Assess this thing's inherent response as well, which isn't just a perfect mathematical line. The world is not arranged quite so conveniently as that. And uh, yeah, your, perf your perfect mathematical lines are very, very useful, but do take this and its actual response into consideration as well. It will pay dividends. You can sometimes avoid getting a little bit of coloration if you spend an extra 10 minutes thinking oh, if I tweaked that baffle width by another inch either smaller or larger or maybe moved the driver slightly that would smooth things out or reduce a bit of output or kick up a little bit of output here and there worth bearing in mind a point I want to always make is the myth that vented boxes, base reflex boxes and whatnot, can't be used near room boundaries. Well, yes, they can, providing you design them right. One of the points there is if you are going to, make sure you've got that damped base alignment. Don't design it to be flat. It will boom. It'll sound awful. But if you design it so it's got a nice rolling off base alignment, then it'll work. It'll work. It'll be fine. Uh, and you can always tweak it. Don't be frightened to put a foam bung in it. You know, it works fine. Bunch of straws, for that matter, also works fine. Old pair of socks, nary a problem. Uh, front vents, rear vents, whatever you wish. If it's going to go right up against a wall, then a front vent obviously is going to be better than a rear vent. Uh, but if it's a reasonable space out, you know, a bit like this, a rear vent's fine. Not a problem providing you've got that sort of reasonably damped alignment. Ensure the box, whatever you build, is rigid enough as well. Now, I am not the world's biggest fan of MDF. 
because it's very, very high mass. Well, it's high-ish mass at any rate, but it's not very stiff, which is not great for base boxes. It's great for mid-range boxes, and it's great for something that you might bolt a tweeter into. But the problem that you've got, and this is, not everybody agrees with this, but it is, uh, there, is a de there is a degree of truth, is that um, you can push with high-ish mass the resonant frequency of your panels right down into the main box operating region where the most energy is available to excite them. Not great. And you need practically concrete-like thicknesses to prevent that. It's just, it's, you need to go with what Avalon do, which is four or five inch thick front baffles, which is, for most people, just a nightmare. It's not practical. Something like a quality plywood, on the other hand, it pushes the resonant frequency of the panels up. Now, that's not a bad thing, actually. People sort of get, you know, sort of give it the box that will belt, and they go, oh, it's ringing. It's ringing. It's ringing like a bell. Well, good. Because these things operating don't operate like you belting the box with your knuckles. It's not, the analogy doesn't hold very well. It's not representative. There's not that much energy at high frequencies left to excite the panel resonances. Good materials for box design are actually cold rolled steel, if you can avoid the magnetics, and aluminium. Yeah, if you crack on them, they ring like a bell, but not at any frequency that the drivers are ever likely to excite. What little resonance is left, you can quite easily damp out with very, very small amounts of material. So, for base boxes, rigidity in my opinion, is more efficient engineering. For mid-range and tweeter boxes, for a better phrase, then yeah, by all means, high mass, yeah, no area problem, that works fine. That works fine. But um, it's less effective for base enclosures, for me. So that, that's a personal view. Other people take different view. Fine. No, again, no problem. But I tend to try and go for, you know, sort of call engineering efficiency and uh, a little bit of extra spent on a more rigid material I find pays dividends, particularly with wideband drivers. So, worth considering. As you can see, Stefan uses a nice grade Baltic birch plywood. But also, when you're just buying a, you know, a, a kit, if it's made out of MDF and you just fold it up, it looks like MDF. Yeah. Whereas if you haven't got the budget or the skills to be doing veneering or you don't want to be doing the spraying, you could just fold up a birch ply kit, sand it down, which is what's happened there, that's good enough. But equally from that point, if you want to stain it or, you know... And it's harder, I mean... You've, you've been roadie yourself, or equivalent thereof, haven't you? And uh, if, you've, <laughs> if you had been using MDF boxes or um, chipboard or whatever, they wouldn't last five minutes. They, cr they crumble, they're too, they're too soft. This stuff is much harder. It can take a little bit more stick. So it's worth considering. Right, I'm going to shut up.